Welcome to the Bullington Capital Report, hosted by Bill Bullington. For the next hour, you'll receive information on current market conditions and trends that could affect your financial future. If you have a question for Bill, you can participate in today's program by calling 216-901-0945. That's 216-901-0WHK. You can also reach Bill by going to his website, BullingtonCapital.com. So without any additional delay, here's the host of today's program, Bill Bullington. And we're back once again. I don't know if you're ever getting tired of hearing me say that at the beginning of every show. Just let me know. I'll try not to. <laughs> anyway, like the guy said, this is Bill Bullington back here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon, uh, 1420. We'll also be broadcast tomorrow at 6. So if you miss it, you can uh, pick it up on the sister station at 1220. And available on iTunes and now on uh, the Fish's website as a podcast. So you can Google 95.5 The Fish. I think it's 95.5. The, uh, and um, you can pick up the Bullington Capital Report there too. So that's kind of cool. It's amazing all the technology we have today. Anyway, seminar coming up. This one's going to be the day before um, St. Patrick's Day. And it looks like, oh. I don't know. For some reason, I'm getting an error on my website, so I guess don't go there. <laughs> you can call us, 330-664-0700. The, uh, that is pretty interesting. The uh, We'll have to get that back up. I, I can't imagine that it's already filled. It might be. I don't know. We only have 100 seats, so the uh, it may have already filled up, but I always have 20 extra seats that I keep in my back pocket. <laughs> No, the facility actually holds 120, but we normally try to stop it around 100. So anyway, I guess you can't sign up right now. The seminar is going to be about uh, Ben Graham, by the way. Ben Graham was a professor at Columbia uh, University, and he was one of the early hedge fund managers. They didn't call them hedge, fund, hedge funds back then. They called them partnerships, which is what they are, by the way. They're limited partnerships. And uh, so he was a fund manager, did very well, uh, taught Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett was one of his star pupils, one of the few people that ever got an A in his class because his classes were pretty hard. And uh, actually ended up, uh, Warren Buffett ended up working for him right out of college or a little bit after college. He went home and worked for his dad's brokerage firm and then he got a job in New York City working with Ben Graham on value investing. So I thought that it would be a good time to kind of review a lot of those concepts because a lot of the concepts, there's some math to it. There's, there's some accounting. Uh, it's not, uh, there, there's not really a tremendous amount of accounting in there. Uh, it's more about the psychology of investing because it's like 95% psychological, if you ask me. And uh, he put, laid out some guidelines there and I'm going to bring them up to date. I'm going to show you a couple models that I use that I'm sure he would approve of. And um, just kind of bring that up to date. You know, how do the same concepts that worked back then? And incidentally, I read an article once. I think it was in Barron's. And uh, um, might not have been Barron's. I, I can't remember where I read it. Anyway, ben, it was uh, Warren Buffett was talking about Ben Graham and, and went back and did a calculation on Ben Graham's partnership returns. Back in those days, the partners took a percentage of the profits, same way hedge funds do today. Same hedge funds that uh, Warren Buffett just recently blasted <laughs> in his uh, annual letter. The uh, uh, It's funny because Warren Buffett ran a hedge fund and so did Ben Graham. And uh, just to be clear, he didn't say that not anybody could beat the market averages. He just said a lot of them won't. Most of them won't. And there's a lot of truth to that. There is a, a tremendous amount of truth to that. And, the, and he even mentioned the exceptions. So there's truth to that too. So... But the people have a tendency to fix it on one thing or the other. Anyway, make a long story short, this guy's lifetime track record was 14.5% a year. Now, he had managed money through the Depression. Think about that for a second. Going through the Depression and then ending up with a lifetime average 14.5%, that's pretty good. That's actually extremely good. So a lot of the ideas, by the way, that he talked about back then are still alive, still at work today. The market really... that part of the market has not changed. The psychological part of the market hasn't changed at all. That's changed. That's the same. And just different names 
uh, on the companies. In fact, uh, Snap came public. We're going to talk about Snap a little bit later in today's program. Uh, not right now, but Snap came public. And this is not one of the stocks that Warren Buffett or Ben Graham would be interested in, at least not now. Why? Because of the valuation. We'll talk a little bit about Facebook. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some models that I'm, I'm using. I'm working on one model in particular because of what's happened over the past uh, three years. I think there's an opportunity there if I can find a way to take advantage of it. The, uh, I'll let you know uh, by, the sem- by the time the seminar rolls around, I will know whether or not it is something that we can take advantage of. And uh, essentially, what I'm talking about is uh, are, are how the super, super large stocks that also have high quality criteria are overpriced and how that makes it really difficult for the S&P to go up in price without getting even more overpriced. There's a bubble forming. It's in the beginning stages. It's not, you're, it's not like the year 2000. Okay. But if it keeps going the way it's going right now, it's probably going to end up that way. Next three, four, five years, it, it could easily happen. The, uh, the thing that's really nasty about that is it's going to convince a whole lot of people to put money into market cap weighted funds like the S&P 500 index fund, SPY is the ETF. And then it's going to disappoint them again the same way it did in the the year 2000. Meanwhile, between now and then, it could actually be pretty good. But if you want to avoid that, if you want to avoid investing in good quality companies that are overpriced, see, because there are two issues when it comes to investing in stocks that are of utmost importance, especially in the long run. The first thing that's important is that you don't overpay. It doesn't matter how good the company is. If you pay more than you should be paying for it, your returns are likely to be very poor at some point in time. And that's what's happening. That's what I see happening right now with some of the companies. They're not all of them. The companies that are the most overpriced in the S&P 500 tend to be the biggest ones and they tend to have the biggest impact on the index. So if you're investing in that index fund that's investing the identically, you're taking more risk than you need to be right now. And at some point in time, that's going to come back and you know, it's going to hurt you. So you got to be very careful. Uh, I think that if I weed those companies out, and I use, I can actually stick to the companies that make up those indices. I'll probably stick to the S&P 1500. That's small, medium, and large cap. Makes up about half the value of the uh, uh, U.S. stock market, a little bit more than half. And uh, I'm going to stick to those. And I'm going to try to put some quality metrics on there, but also the valuation, the thing I was just talking about, don't overpay. That's the key to the long run. And that's what Ben Graham was talking about back in 1949. Don't overpay. That's a big deal. You go into, let's bring this back to something that most people might be looking at uh, at some point in times in their life, some point in time in their lives. You might be looking to buy a house, especially if you live in America. You've been taught that, you know, the American dream is owning your own home. Okay. It's neither here nor there, but if you know that's what you want to do, you want to own a home, great. What you don't want to do is go into a neighborhood where all the houses are around, let's say they're around 2,500 square feet, and they're all selling for about 250000 to 300000 So right around $100 a square foot okay, in that neighborhood, which is a little low by today's standards, by the way. But I'm just doing this for an example. So if you go in, and every house there sells for somewhere between $100 and $125 a square foot. So you got a $250,000 square foot home that's going to sell somewhere north of $250,000 by a little bit. And then there's one house, one house that's selling for $500,000. And it's still, and it is also 2,500 square feet. Well, now you're paying $200 a square foot in a neighborhood where all the other houses are selling for between $100 and 125 dollars if you hope to, to turn around and sell that house very quickly and earn a decent profit on it, you know, the odds are not in your favor. In fact, if you pay twice what everybody else is paying, it may take an incredibly long time for you to sell it without taking a significant loss. Does that make sense? 
So you got to find a way of doing that with stocks. That's what Ben Graham was talking about. You got to find a way of doing that with stocks. And when you're doing it with with funds, mutual funds, uh, exchange traded funds, the number one and number two things people typically ask is how much does it cost? You know, what are the expenses? And what's the track record? Like speed and cost they feel like are the two most important things. And I understand because that's probably all the information they have access to, quite frankly. Uh, they don't know that they have access to much more information that's free that would actually help them make a much better decision. And I shouldn't complain about that. And I'm not complaining about that because it's why I have a job. <laughs> yeah, you want to find out what they're doing with the money. You want to find out if they're investing in companies that don't have earnings yet, but are going to have earnings one day. Okay, that that fund basically got lucky. That is an unsustainable strategy. Sooner or later, that one comes back uh, in a big way. There, the pendulum swings back the other way in a big way. So, you want to find out not just how much they're charging, what their track record is, but what are they doing with their money? How are they investing that? Does it make sense to you? What have been the, uh, uh, how much has it declined by in the past? I just had a conversation this morning with the uh, potential future investor. Very nice guy. And we're talking about this very topic this morning. It's great to look at long-term track records, but it's better to know how the money's being managed. And it's good to know and get familiar with what kind of volatility those things have experienced in the past. You can tell me what someone's doing, and I've been doing this for so long, I can tell you what their average volatilities are probably going to be just based on what they've been doing. And uh, um, why? Because I've done this for a long time. <laughs> because I've looked at these things over and over, and it's like driving a car. You know, By the time you've been driving a car for 10 years, you don't have to really think as much. I don't know, Quite frankly, most people aren't thinking when they're driving anymore, especially the ones that have cell phones. <laughs> Yeah, but you don't have to think that too that hard about it. And, and again, if you worked really hard at this and did this for a very long time, you'd come to the same conclusions. The uh, it's, uh, any professional would. Well, I shouldn't say that. No, no, I'm just going to leave that alone for for right now. Also, later in today's program, incidentally, just in case you're interested, I have a stock I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about three stocks. I'm going to talk about two stocks that are overvalued. I'm going to talk about another stock that came up on my skin. And uh, the lookout for the bull website, by the way, for those of you that are, that are interested, it's almost ready. We've uh, got one final thing that we have to do should be done within the next week or so. By the time the seminar is, is up, we'll be able to uh, open that site to the general public. One of the stocks that I'm going to talk about later in today's program came up on the scan yesterday. I really like what they do. I really love the chart. I mean, the, the trend looks awesome. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, if you're listening to the podcast, then maybe you want to skip forward to that section if that's all you wanted <laughs> to get from there. But uh, I think it's got a pretty good chance of uh, of going a lot higher. And I'll tell you why I think that uh, later on in today's program. If I forget, by the way, somebody remind me. Somebody call me in and remind me. But the uh, back to what we were talking about slightly earlier. You know, we're talking about Ben Graham uh, investing. Uh, there's a seminar coming up where I'm going to talk. I'm going to bring that kind of up to speed, kind of modern day, give us some some modern variations on the themes that he used to invest back in the early 1900s. That led to a very good, actually very good, a, a an excellent long term track record. It wasn't very good. It was excellent okay. long term track record. Kind of common sense stuff on a lot of this, but it's common sense with knowledge of how stocks actually behave. It's funny that I get calls still to this day from people that I've actually been working with for years and they've watched a stock and good news came out on the stock and it crashed. And they're, they're still perplexed by that. They don't remember a lot of the conversations we've had. Uh, that's okay. It's another reason I have a job is to remind people, it's kind of like a coach. You know, most professional tennis players have coaches. It's not because they don't know how to play tennis. It's because in the heat of the moment, they may forget some of the basics, the fundamentals, and the coach sees it. That's why they have a coach. The coach will say, hey, 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 
you know, you're breaking your arm on this, you're not getting enough backspin on the ball, whatever. The, um, but it's to, run, it's to remind them to do what they already know they need to do. And uh, That's kind of a position that I have. I can teach you how to do anything I'm doing. I really can. And I can teach it in about an hour. I can't remind you to do it. You know, when the market's crashing, when Trump makes a speech or puts out a tweet out there that upsets everybody, and, uh, markets start to go haywire, to go back, to remember, to pay attention to the fundamentals, sometimes that's a pretty difficult thing to do. And uh, so it's one of the reasons I have a job because I'm going to do what I need to do. I've been conditioned. This is not my first rodeo. <laughs> so I'll be there with you, help you, and uh, I'll do the things I need to do uh, for both our, our better goods. The uh, That's another thing that's important. How do you deal with financial advisors? But that's another show. So again, if you go to the website, um, right now it doesn't look like it's able to accept anybody because it looks like it, it filled up. I, I doubt that that's actually, uh, true. I think it's probably more a, a glitch with the, uh, software itself, but I'll double check you know, I'd be surprised because that would mean that, uh, the vast majority of people that signed up, signed up over the past three days. And that could be, I don't know. I'll have to check. So if you just want to call us. 330-664-0700. If you can't write that down, it's Bullington Capital. If you go uh, Google Bullington Capital, my name will come up. The firm will come up. You can call us because uh, this is important. See, in, in in my mind, there are two things that are extremely important if you want to be successful financially. If you want to be successful financially, you've got to get two things down. The first thing you have to get down is learning how to live beneath your means, not within your means. You got to learn how to live beneath your means because you're going to have to save stuff. You're going to have to save money. If you have a job, if you have a business, that's a different issue altogether. And to get really rich, you're probably going to have to own a business. And what I mean, I'm talking really rich, it's like super rich. You want to have more than several million dollars, you're probably going to have to build a business. But if you want to be comfortable, then you got to learn how to live beneath your means. You got to learn how to live beneath your means. That's the first thing. The next thing you're going to have to learn how to do is how to invest. You're going to have to learn how to invest. And you need to do better than the average investor does. The average investor, by the way, doesn't do well. So that's the good news. It's not hard to beat. (laughs) Uh, The bad news is a lot of people try and and fail, and they don't really know why they're failing. And uh, that's what the seminar is all about. Now that I hear the music, that means I have to take a real quick commercial break. You're listening to Bill Bullington right here on 1420 The Answer. I'll be back after these messages. And we're back. You're listening to Bill Bullington here every Saturday morning from 11 to noon on 1420. Soon to be on the, uh, uh, another frequency I've heard through the this, through this station, so we'll be on more than one frequency, and I think the other one's an FM frequency, so that should be kind of cool. And uh, you can also pick us up at the Fish's website. There's a uh, podcast. It, this show is in the form of a podcast there. Uh, and you can also find it on Apple iTunes. If you'd like to go in there and just type in Bullington Capital, it'll bring you right to it. Feel free to call today if you have a question, 216-901-0945. 216-901-0945. And you can get a... um. um a lot of uh, good information just by contacting us. In fact, we had somebody that uh, uh, actually, I, f- I can't remember who it is now, but <laughs> some, somebody had called us or, or actually reached out to us through a uh, text. I think it was an email and was asking about a specific type of investment program called the 26F, okay, 26F. So I Googled it and I spent uh, a couple hours actually uh, reading some of this stuff and there is no 26 F, uh, retirement plan in the IRS's database, you know, like the 401k, 403b, all that kind of stuff doesn't exist there. So evidently this was inc- invented by someone, uh, and they put it out there to kind of make it look like a uh, government program. Cause they like to do that, put a lot of letters and numbers you know, like the 401k plan. And, uh, so this is a, a program from what I've been able to gather, that's been put together by multiple companies, and it's more like a uh, subscription investment program. 
and probably just in uh, regular stocks. But you got to beware because uh, some of these things can be Ponzi schemes. And they can call themselves 26F since there's no formal definition. Like I can't create a, a an account and say this is a 401k plan uh, because no one will take that. Yeah, all the custodians, Fidelity, Schwab, uh, Folio, uh, E-Trade, all those firms have specific paperwork for a 401k plan. So if you tried to call your account a 401k plan and open it there, they're not going to let you unless it uh, abides by by the rules follow, governing a 401k plan, and you follow all those steps and procedures. So what I'm saying is there is no formal definition of this that I can find. So if you can find something and you've got something uh, out there, feel free to, to email it to me. But I did not see anything. And uh, it looked like it could be something that uh, is not what it appears to be. Uh, so I think it's just a, a private name that somebody gave some sort of investment strategy. And from what I could gather, a lot of it was just investing in mutual funds, agreeing to invest a certain amount of money into the mutual funds and getting some sort of return back. You know, those used to be called annuities too. There was a type of annuity that you would make payments into over your lifetime. And they would agree that at some point in time in your life, that you'd stop making payments and then it would start to pay you back. So that was a type of an annuity uh, that quite frankly doesn't even exist anymore. But uh, so I wish I could be of more help there. The, uh, and like I said, if you know of anything like that, uh, or have heard any more information on it, feel free to drop me an email, but it doesn't look like anything that's uh, uh, significant. So I don't think I would spend an awful lot of time into that. And again, if you've been offered one of those programs, have them send me the offering memorandum uh, or the prospectus, and I will take a look at it. The uh, It's interesting. This business has grown exponentially since I started in it. I can't believe it's going on 30 years. Yeah, and I'm getting old. <laughs> but uh, anyway, when I first started in the industry, there were about 1,500 mutual funds, and there were about ooh, right around seven, a little over 7,000 stocks uh, that were listed on the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. Those were the two big stock exchanges. Also, the Amex was much bigger back then. Today, it's mostly ETFs. But the uh, So the two major exchanges in the United States, anyway, are the New York and the NASDAQ. And uh, to be listed on them, you have to meet certain requirements, so certain quality requirements. Uh, and uh, uh, anyway, so right around 7,000 or about 10,000 if you added in a bunch of stocks that didn't trade much or traded uh, off of those major exchanges. But those were uh, like penny stocks or stocks that are very thinly traded, uh, a lot riskier in most cases. And uh, so for all intents and purposes, he had about 7,000 stocks to pick from. The number of stocks available today that are big enough for an institution to invest in, like a mutual fund, uh, is just a little over 3,200. So it's a little less than half, a little less than half the stocks are available. And the funds, mutual funds, are around 1,500 back in those days. The funds have grown to tens of thousands. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the competition is significantly greater than it used to be. Because you had several stocks for each and every fund that existed 30 years ago. And today, you've got several funds that, exi that exist for every single stock. <laughs> and these funds are huge, you know, a lot of them. I think there were around 4,000 now that have over a billion dollars in assets in them. Think about that. 4,000 funds with at least a billion dollars in assets. What does that mean? Well, it means that you've got to be more patient than you used to be because the chances of you knowing something that other people don't already know are nearly zero. Uh, it's your interpretation of the news that could be different, that could bring you out ahead uh, in the long run if you're willing to be a super patient investor. Uh, but more often than not, any adv any advantage that you're going to that you're going to get is from having a slightly more concentrated portfolio where you're limiting the number of stocks in your portfolio, maybe to forty or fifty. That's typically where I tend to settle on for a particular strategy rather than trying to hold four or 500, which is what every multi-billion dollar fund has to do. All the big funds 
are invested in hundreds of stocks. So the edge that you have as an individual investor is not having to hold hundreds of stocks. Your top 40 will generally beat the top 400. That makes sense? So that's one of the reasons I do what I do. It makes me different. I don't need to hold 500 stocks in a portfolio. And I definitely don't, don't need to hold 500 stocks in a portfolio and then hold 10 or 12 portfolios all holding four or 500 stocks. <laughs> you wonder why you don't beat the market? You are the market. <laughs> you probably hold nearly every stock in the market when you do that. <laughs> and, and that's one of the reasons people kind of get upset. Like, hey, I'm not doing as well as the averages are. Well, you know, that's really hard to do because you are the average. You know, you get 14 funds in there all holding several hundred stocks. There are only 3,000 stocks. Yeah, so you've got them all. <laughs> so you're, uh, if, if you want to do better than that, you've got to concentrate your holdings, which, by the way, can be really dangerous in the wrong hands. It can be very dangerous in the wrong hands. You need to have philosophies to govern your activity in the market. It's an emotional place. That's what Ben Graham was talking about in 1949. That's the part that hasn't changed. You've got to have some, some basic rules that govern your activity in the market. If you don't have rules, you better get with somebody that does. <laughs> and, the, uh, and if they don't have rules, you know, it'll be apparent. Unfortunately, it's going to be apparent, oh, about 15 years from now when you haven't made as much money <laughs> as, as you probably should have. Uh, you also have to try to understand what those methods are. That's why I like to keep them relatively simple. Not only are they, do they happen to be more effective in the long run, the, uh, but it gives you the psychological comfort of saying, okay, I get it. But let's go to my dividend model for a second. So here's the dividend model. I take the 500 biggest companies in the country by size. The overlap with the S&P 500 is like 99.9%, .9%, by the way. <laughs> so take the 500 biggest Break them up into the 11 sectors that uh, Morgan Stanley says make up the stock market. They used to be only be 10. Now there's 11, 11 major sectors. And each one of those sectors, I want to buy the stocks, the four stocks that have the highest dividend yields. One of the sectors, by the way, in some cases, doesn't have four stocks that have dividends. So I only buy the ones they have. The, um, there are three. So that's the idea. That's the general idea. Why does that have a tendency to work? Well, it comes back to the psychology. When the market uh, goes down because everybody's fearful and people are selling, they're pulling money out of stocks, the stocks that pay dividends are going to go down too because they're part of the stock market. And when the stock market's falling there, generally today, they most of the 90, probably 96% of them move together. That means your chances of picking one that resists the urge to follow the rest of the stocks is one in 25. Do you feel lucky? Yeah. That being said, they're all going to go down together. So those stocks that are paying dividends, if I have a, let's say I got a $50 stock and the dividend on it is a uh, buck 50, dollar 50. That's 3%. That $50 stock drops all the way to 25, which would be, you know, in a big correction. Yeah, they're not going to cut the dividend. The dividend's still going to be $1.50. They don't cut the dividend because the share price goes down. So $1.50 now I've got to have is actually 6% of 25 bucks. See what happened there? The dividend yield doubled because the share price got cut in half. Now, if there's nothing wrong with the company, or if the company really, if the sales and profits haven't really changed all that much, the only thing that's really changed is the share price, you might want to buy some more of that. And that's what we do in that dividend model. That's it. That's the essentials. That's the one that's closest to what Ben Graham was doing back in the early 1900s and ended up making him 14 and a half. That's what his investors got, by the way, because he got paid on, you know, on top of that. Had he not made any money himself, not taken in a portion of the profits, which is what a partnership does, okay, the returns would have been higher. So... Very, very, very similar. And again, that, that seminar is coming up on the 16th, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to uh, get my, uh, I don't know. I can't imagine that thing has already sold out. If it's sold out, we will end up adding extra seats to it. So if you go to the website, and uh, it's Bullington Capital, you can't sign up. 
then just call us 330-664-0700. You can call the radio station. Because I think you're going to want to see this one, particularly today. Particularly today. I'm starting to see a um, some stocks sell at valuations they shouldn't be they shouldn't be selling for. They're a little ahead of themselves. Their value. They're not the $200 per square foot house in the neighborhood that's where all the other houses are $125 a square foot. They're more like $175 bucks where everybody else is $125. Still not comfortable, especially if the market drops. Those stocks will have a tendency to drop faster than the market overall. They've also been the stocks that have gone up more than the market has overall over the past several years. Okay, So what goes around comes around sooner or later. Yeah, you want to be prepared. Value-oriented strategies, I think, are are kind of uh, key right now. Uh, and I still hold some momentum. We'll talk about that in a different show. But I think going forward, over the next 12, 18, 24 months, you probably want to be doing some value stuff, overweighting that in your portfolios. Stocks that pay dividends. Stocks who have high cash flows relative to their share prices. That's a big deal. That's another model we'll be talking about at that, at that seminar. And incidentally, you can always call and set an appointment if you want to come in and talk about this yourself. Because back to something I had alluded to uh, earlier in today's program, the two things that are most important financially for your financial future. First one's living beneath your means. You got to learn how to live beneath your means somehow. If you're a business owner, that's really tough because you don't know what your uh, expenses are. They're a lot more volatile. But if you have a job, it's, you know, especially if you're not commission only, if you have a job, it's a lot easier because you know how much is coming in roughly. So now all you have to do is get your budget to the point where you can save about 15% of that. You need to try to save about 15% of that. I'll tell you why a little bit later. But for now, that's the first thing you need to do. Learn, learn how to live beneath your minute. The second thing you need to do is you need to learn how to be a better than average investor. It's not that hard. And according to Dalbar, this is a a firm whose uh, reason for being, one of their major reasons for being, their consulting firm, is studying uh, investor behavior. Their clients are the big mutual fund complexes, the big wealth management firms all over the world. So they study the average uh, investor's behavior and they publish the results every year. And in their studies, going back decades, average investor tends to make less than half of what they could make just by investing in some index funds and leaving them alone, which is not my favorite way to invest. So they would be better off in a balanced account, stocks, bonds, and cash, following a method. Uh, you can call it an algorithm, call it whatever you want, but they would be way better off. And the average investor would do significantly better than they're doing now if they just had a plan. They just had a plan doesn't have to be a great plan. A mediocre plan is fine as long as you stick to it. Actually, a mediocre plan would do better than most people do if somebody if they just stuck to it. And that's a big deal. You know, wanting to get rich quick, that you, that that's tough. That's incredibly difficult to do without taking an enormous amount of risk. So, wanting to uh, earn decent returns over time, it hasn't been that hard to do over the past hundred years or so. And we've gone through a lot tougher times than we're facing right now. And you still would have been able to get returns that would be significantly higher than what you would get in a bank or you would get in treasuries. You know, there, uh, there was a time period when I, we couldn't say that back in the early eighties, tre- the return on a treasury was 60% higher than the average annual return on the stock market at one point in time. Now that would have been the time to buy bonds. <laughs> <laughs> not when they're near zero. <laughs> now that I hear the music. Uh, stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to talk about a couple of individual stocks and uh, take your calls if you'd like. 216 901 0945. Listen to Bill Bowling right here on 1420 The Answer. I'll be right back. And we're back. Hey, I just realized there's a report on this service that I use called Y Charts. And uh, it's a one page report, it's a summary. 
and has just about everything you need to uh, do your own analysis on a company. How cool is that? I didn't even know it was there. <laughs> I've only been using it for two years. The uh, That is funny. So anyway, we're talking about uh, investment planning. That's the second most important thing you can do to make yourself successful financially. First is living beneath your means. Next one is be a better than average investor. Get a strategy. Get a couple of them. I've got several of them that I really like, and whether or not I, de- I uh, recommend one to one of my clients depends on their situation and their personality, their age, their financial condition, all that kind of stuff. Got to take that into account. But the bottom line is I mean, I've got some older investors who are really aggressive because they're very well healed. We've got a lot of money. And, uh, and they enjoy the process. So I think, awesome. That's really cool. The, uh, I can show you how to do that. I'll show you my more aggressive models. I like them. Uh, they happen to like them. They get, uh, when I explain them in detail, they really like them because it's, it fits their personality. I have some younger people who are super conservative. And I mean super conservative. To the point that we've had to have met many conversations about, listen, you need to be open to watching your account value fluctuate a little bit more so that you can earn enough money to be able to quit your job one day, uh, whether you want to or not. Okay. Yeah. By that, I mean, at some point in time, you want to probably step away and stop working. And uh, that's kind of a big deal. And. It's not always easy, by the way. That's probably one of the hardest things that you'll ever have to do. So so many people are so afraid. And uh, what generally happens, this is the average investor that I'm describing right now. What generally happens is they'll get really brave after they've seen the market go up a lot, not realizing that it's not going to keep going straight up like that. And in the back of their minds, I know they're hoping that it will. And then they get upset when they get a correction. And when they, when they get a big correction, a lot of them pull go back to cash and say, you know, I knew I shouldn't have done that. And that is not a good strategy. So the better strategy is to say, hey, I'm going to find some strategies that I, several strategies, maybe just one, one good one, dividend one would be a good one. I'm going to stick to this strategy, come hell or high water. I'm going to do it. I'm just going to dedicate myself to staying to this strategy. But I don't have to do it with all my money. That's the key. It's not trying to figure out when to get in wing and when to get uh, back out again, in and out. That is not. Most people try to do that and they fail. Most professionals try to do that and they fail. The people that try to, to, to do that generally fail. The people that are successful doing that are not doing it like you think they are. They've actually got these things called algorithms and uh, computers, supercomputers, fiber optic, fiber optic connections to the stock exchanges, and you know, to compete with them, you got to have about a billion dollars. So you can get that out of your mind. And by the way, that is a fraction of the uh, those firms that do that. They're called high frequency traders. They are a fraction of the firms that are actually a part of Wall Street. They're just a fraction. They do a lot of volume, but they are a fraction. Unless you got a billion dollars, you can't do that. Okay. A billion dollars may not even be enough anymore. There's, there's been a lot of competition, and a lot of these guys have popped up. They work for one firm, they go and start their own. Anyway, so that's off the table for the average investor. So the average investor has got to do what I talked about earlier. You're going to have to concentrate your positions. You don't need to hold thousands of stocks or hundreds of stocks. Uh, 150 at the most is what you'd really need to if you're doing individual stock portfolios in, uh, you know, the top 150 generally going to do better than the top 500 over time. Not every year though, the top 500 by size, when everybody's buying will outperform you. Why? Because it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If it keeps going up because people keep buying it and they keep buying it because it keeps going up. Well, it's going to stop, keep going up until the money starts to stop. When money starts to leave the market, the same process happens in reverse. So that's where strategies really come into play. Sticking it out, understanding it, being comfortable with it, 
not having too much of your money into those strategies. That's a, that's a big deal. If you have too much money in the stock strategies, you know when you're going to find out that you were overweighted? That's right, when it's down 50%. If I had 80% of my money in stock funds, this is funny, I had a, I had a client show me this portfolio that was 85% stock. It was 85% stock. He's going, hey, how come uh, my portfolio is not doing as good as this portfolio? Because uh, I got 50% in fixed income. <laughs> and those guys are 100% or almost 100%, 85% in stock. Yeah, well, that's going to beat. I don't care what you're doing on the stock side. So it comes down to how much do you have in stocks versus fixed income. If an 85% portfolio will have uh, should have higher long-term returns than one that's only 50% or 60%. Should have higher long-term returns. It's also going to fluctuate significantly more. So it's the risk that you're willing to take that, you know, it's got to be kind of quantified somehow. And this is basically how I do it. I just ask you, how much fluctuation will you are you willing to see? If you don't want to be down 50%, don't put all your money in stocks. Um, what can you take? And then I would say the common answer is probably 25%. Understanding that that's fluctuation. Stock prices fluctuate both ways. Okay. Now, but if 25% fluctuation, if you're, the market's down 50%, you can bet the stock funds you have are going to be down at least 50%. So if I only had half of my money in the stock funds and they're all down 50% or stock portfolios, and I'm only down 25%. See how easy that works? See how easy that is? If I know stocks could drop 50% or more, the uh, and I limit my exposure to stocks to 50%, guess what? If that 50% drop happens, I'm probably going to be down somewhere between somewhere around 25%, give or take, depending on what you're doing with the money. But uh, you'll probably be within 2 3 4% of what anybody else that has the same allocation is doing. Uh, in the long run, if you're doing the right things, if you're concentrating the portfolios and putting them into something like a, a dividend model that says, okay, I'm going to buy more when they drop. I'm actually going to rebalance the portfolio uh, once or twice a year, maybe every quarter. Okay. Then uh, you'll be able to take advantage more. Uh, you'll be able to take more advantage of market swings. So a more highly volatile market actually benefits you. That's kind of cool. And you don't have to uh, worry about it when uh, we're doing it. We're going to do it. Uh, if you know, no doubt about it that Bullington Capital, we're going to pull the trigger. We're going to rebalance those portfolios. When I say rebalance, what that means is it takes a look at each position in that portfolio. If one of them's down, but it's still in the model, we're going to add money to it. If one of them's gone way up and no longer qualifies because it's overpriced now, it's going to be gone. It's not buy and hold, it's buy and manage. That's the key. Buy and manage. If the entire allocation, let's say the we've only got one portfolio for the, to represent the stock, which is highly unusual, but the uh, if we have one or two or even three portfolios that represent the stock, and the stock's got the, the stocks make up sixty percent of the account, and you had this big correction like you did in two thousand nine, okay, half the value of those things are gone. So we'll take money out of the fixed income and add it to that. That's the the big picture allocation. That's the big picture. That's everything. So what are we doing there? We're buying when prices are down, when prices are low. Ooh, you know what? I got to take a quick phone call and I forgot. I promised to talk about these individual stocks and I will get to them, but I'm going to have to hurry. And hey, Jerry, were you calling to hey, remind hey, me? Well, <laughs> yeah, well, that and uh, how about Square? I, uh, you said you're going to be pulling the trigger on that uh, earlier this week. I'm just curious. Uh, how I'd see what yeah. And I'm kind of curious what some other picks are. So get off the air and listen. Okay, I, I was going to say I'm, I'm only getting about every third word that you're saying, but uh, um, so Square had a, a little pullback this week, not much, actually right around the price that we had first started talking about it. So it hasn't budged a whole lot yet. The uh, still like the company uh, quite a bit. It's got a lot of momentum. That stock drops 10 percent below my purchase price. I'm out. Okay, that's not a uh, it's not a stock that I would just buy and hold. Its valuation's not cheap enough, but the momentum on it, the chart looks really good. So we will talk about that at the next seminar too. 
I'll uh, do at least 20, 30 minutes. Now, one of the other ones that came up on a scan, and these are trades. This, these are not investments. There's a difference. I'm putting on my an entirely different hat now. And I only have 60 seconds to do it. So I'm going to have to tell you. Scientific Games Corporation, you can look it up, SGMS. I will probably end up buying that Monday. Uh, and I won't buy it the first half hour, so I'll give you the, the jump on me. Uh, I won't buy it until after the first half hour is over. But they make lottery games. They make lottery games. SGMS, go look up the symbol if you'd like. The valuation on that stock is very low. The valuation is one one hundredth of the valuation of Snap that just came public. One one hundredth. <laughs> anyway, I hear the music. That means I'm going to have to take uh, actually the whole week off. I won't be back till next week, Saturday morning, 11 o'clock. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good week, good investing, and good luck. You just caught another episode of the Bullington Capital Report, broadcasting every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. on AM 1420, The Answer. If you have a question and would like to speak to Bill personally, you can call him at 330-664-0700. That's 330-664-0700. Or contact him through his website, BullingtonCapital.com. That's BullingtonCapital.com. Past performance may not be indicative of future results. Therefore, no current or prospective client should assume that the future performance of any specific investment, investment strategy, including the investments and or investment strategies recommended and or purchased by advisor or product made reference to directly or indirectly will be profitable. Different types of investment involve varying degrees of risk, and there can be no assurance that any specific investment will either be suitable or profitable for a client's investment portfolio. No client or prospective client should assume that any information presented serves as the receipt of or substitute for personalized investment advice from the advisor or any other investment professional. The preceding program has been paid for by Bullington Capital Management, LLC. The preceding program's views, claims, or representations may not reflect those of AM 1420 The Answer or Salem Media Group.